Oh, good afternoon. Thank you for coming today. So let me explain a bit about me for those. Some of you I already know. So I have two kind of careers. I was a professor at the University of Barcelona in the business school for many years. Then I quit that. I got tired of that. Moved to Washington, D.C. Um, for 15 years. I was in the intelligence community. I was director of innovation for the largest defense company in the country of the world. So about three years ago, I retired of that. And now I teach full time here at the business school. I was already teaching part time at the Fruno Center, but mostly executive education courses for companies, for like most in the area of, of strategy implementation. So I was working for like track bikes, they will hire the business school, and they will sit down with the executives and work their strategic plan for two days with that kind of things, but sort of a, for part time, I was commuting every day, every week to Washington, D.C. But about three years ago, I joined the business school, and they asked me to teach. This course is called Fundamentals of Management for Non-Business Majors. At that time, I was teaching that in the largest room at the business school, who can see 261 people. But there were 400 on the waiting list. So it was always kind of like, it's a pain to handle because especially some schools have made this class required to graduate. So if you are a dietitian, you have to take this class to graduate. So there are some schools who are beginning, and the problem was we were having people who could not enroll and they could not graduate. And it became sort of like a logistic problem. I'm on deans, so I wasn't involved in that. So we decided, well, what can we do? So obviously it came the idea of let's do this class online. So we are now fully online. This is the, this is the fourth semester I'm teaching this fully online. So I spent about a year and a half working with uh, instructional designer, Mark Newfield, I don't know, for those of you who know. Because we decided that we didn't wanna just try to translate what we were doing face to face, just try to put it online. So we wanted to take advantage of redefine the whole thing, and start from scratch. So it took about a year and a half to, to do that. But we went really, really deep in like, <coughs> from the learning outcomes, from the big ideas, but also we wanted to do in a way that it wasn't just the, st the standard online course. So I decided to, all my lectures are podcasts. Everything has been recorded, my voice, no video, and has been produced in the studio and edited. So there's music, sound effects, interviews. So we decided that to give it a try to that idea how that will work. So every week there are two or three podcasts that I recorded and then a number of exercises, quite a bit. That is about the students have to submit between two and three assignments per week. So that represented some logistic issues, especially now the enrollment is every semester, any time between three and 400 students. We do this now every semester, spring, summer, and fall. So how can you do that? So <coughs> what I, I mean, first I have five TAs that, I mean, are helping with the grading. Plus, we wanted to come up with something that was, how can you provide meaningful feedback to 400 students every week? So how do you balance individual attention with a scale? So we went with the idea of rubrics, very elaborated rubrics, which was a pain in the butt to create, I have to say. Because I have about 45 assi assignments in the semester. So I created a single rubric custom made for that assignment. So it took a while, but those are the things that pay off now, right? Because that also helped me with my TAs to kind of like reduce, I wouldn't say eliminate, but reduce some level of subjectivity when grading. So the, the, the rubrics are very specific. The students get the rubric beforehand. They get the rubric, they do the assignment, and the TA is great on the rubric. And those of you who are familiar with Moodle or Canvas, you know that we click on the rubric, change colors, we calculate the grades, plus we provide feedback. We also encourage, and I, 
I don't know how much you want to see all of this. You, you, you can interrupt me anytime. More than going into any particular thing and giving an overview of how I'm doing this. And if you want to see how, how did you do this, just let me know. So we use the rubrics first to provide meaningful feedback given the scale, but also to reduce some subjectivity. So I do some exercises with the TAs that I call calibration. So we do a few assignments. They grade with the same rubric. We sit down and talk about it to make sure that more or less we are within the same range when it comes to. So we also encourage the students, many of the assignments, the students have to record themselves. Instead of writing, they have to record an audio segment. And we use Canvas. You can only use Canvas. We try to stay away from <coughs> files in different formats. The money, everything has to be in the Canvas framework. Because we didn't want to have to download these files in MP4, these files in FLB, these files in QuickTime. No, no, no. We have to, when you have this number of students, you have to be very kind of like stay to the framework. And that has worked really well. Students were are kind of the first few weeks kind of surprised because they are used to write things, not to record. And we also have improved the rubrics as we move along every week, the rubrics get more detailed. And they really enjoy it. At the end of the semester, we give them back their first recording and the last one, and they can see how, how they have improved, not only in terms of the content of the course, but their talk, their speech, how they present things. But it's not just how much they know. In fact, that's, that's my, one of the reasons why they hired me, probably at the business school, was, I mean, I've been in academia, but also I've been in the real world, and I hired <coughs> The company I was working for, we are 40,000 employees, and I have 3,000 people that reported to me. So I, I have the privilege of the bad luck of hiding and fighting a lot of people. And one of the things that I always say is that it's not how much you know. I've had a lot of people who have a full GPA, but they are unable to talk in public, to make a presentation to, to the board, to explain an issue and come out with an idea. So how, how do you balance all those things? Especially for this class, which is fundamentals of management for people who are not at the business school, that also represented a challenge because I have sophomore, junior, senior, master, and PhD students in this class. All the background, people from fashion design, which I didn't even know that UW offers that, but it does. You have fashion designers to nuclear engineers. You have a whole spectrum. It's how do you provide a course that is meaningful to everybody that can be managed online and that at the same time is still have some it's still a three credit course from the business school. So this class requires about ten to twelve hours a week of work. And when I said that to the students I say this is not a joke. In fact the first week I usually about how many people drop the class. Once they see what is coming they get scared and they drop it. Go ahead. So um how, how do the students, do you see a lag? Like at first they kind of <coughs> not really participate in the online course and then they start going, okay, I gotta take this seriously and then they start doing more? Yeah, what, what, what tends to happen, and I can show you, is like the first week, people think this is an online class, so I don't log in. First week goes by, I will catch up later, and when they log in the first time, they, already, they have already missed six assignments that were due last week. And then a lot of people get scared and drop the class. Because there's an assignments every week, from the first week. And there's deadlines, and if you miss the deadline by one minute, I don't care. This is like real business. Well, I worked really hard on this assignment, but I forgot to submit. Here you get a zero. If you work with me, you will be fired. You go to the airport one minute late, you can cry wherever you want, but you don't get into that plane. So I, the students have to wait to do the assignments. If you wait until 11.56, the deadline is 11.55. And there's a reason for that, it's not midnight. Because if, I don't use midnights or noons, because people get all kinds of confusions. So everything is 11.55. Clean. <laughs> so it's 11.55 p.m. So there's, if you are submit at 11.56, Canvas will say it's late. So I say, you have two weeks to do this. If you wait till 11.50, you are late, I'm sorry. If at 
the internet in your apartment building is gone, I'm sorry. If your hard drive crashed, I'm sorry. That's why you have Google Drive, you have Box, you can have real iCloud or cloud, real time backups. So I put the, the, the layout of the field is the first day to the point that they have to do a quiz of the syllabus. They have to get 100% right before they can move forward. And in that syllabus, you say, you are minute, one minute late, you get 50% penalty, true or false. So they have to say true. So they, they, ca they cannot come back later, oh, I didn't know. No. And the problem is, it's not that I, I oh, you are mean. I say, I'm not mean, but I have 400 people here. I cannot start establishing all this, oh, my cat died, my plane, I have a flat tire. This not, you have to, one of the principles of this class is not only how much you know, you have to know how to manage your time, know your commitments, plan ahead, organize yourself. So that's one of the principles that is around this class. And, and not only I say, I apply. And some people get really scared. I mean, by, this, by, the, by the first week of the semester, there were about 473 people enrolled in this class. About 100 people have already dropped. But some of them drop because they get scared that they still need this class to graduate so they may come back later. But again, it's also a way of how do you manage this number of people? This is an online class, I don't see them. So it's not like you show up twice a week for an hour and 15 minutes, kind of try to stay awake and it will go by. I tell them this class, re you are, this class relies on you. You have to do a lot of the work, I'm here to help. But this is an online class and this is what this means. And more and more, the belief that if it's online, it's watered down, it's disappearing. And still some people think, oh, if it's online, it must be easier. I, th I would say that that's kind of disappearing, but still some people think that. So this is, this is a regular three credit class. So it requires what is supposed to be the, the same amount of work. Can, can I see an example of, of, of your feedback? I'm truly curious about how extensive is the feedback? How we send it back? So what, what happens is the students, so every, the course is divided in models. And all, all the models have the same structure. So the models have at the beginning, what is the model about? What are the objectives of the model? Then they have the podcast. Then they have readings, videos, and, and the assignments. So it's always the same structure. Every week has my podcast, videos, readings, and assignments. In this case, there were three assignments for, it was the, the first week of the semester, right? So for example, and I divided the assignments in two kinds of assignments, what, I, what we call major assignments, which is not one every week, maybe every other week, and what we call a standard assignments. So the standard assignments, they can drop four. I always say, we all have busy life, in one week you, you have another exam, you have a commitment, you can drop up to four assignments, I will not care which ones. It's that, that you manage that. So, for example, this is, the first, this is the first assignment of the whole semester. So the rubric is very simple. This requires them to record a uh, three minute limit audio recording. And this is the rubric. They get the rubric in advance. and the, the TA is great with this rubric. The rubric, uh, are you guys familiar with the speed graded? You get the assignment reading and you get the rubric and the TAs are, in this case, the assignments are recording. So you listen to the recording while you have the rubric in front of you and then you, you just click on the rubric. And sometimes we write a sentence next to, you can write a feedback for the whole assignment at the bottom in the speed graded, or you can write feedback for each of these line criteria. So in some assignments, if they are really bad or they make a huge mistake, we write something. Sometimes the TAs record themselves. They, they have to, two of the five TAs I have find that recording is faster than typing. 
So they record. There's an option to record your voice. And you can say, oh, you missed the point here. This is wrong or whatever. And they record it. And the student gets that back. So what I do is I have mute the gra in the grading book. I have mute the assignments. But that's another thing I learned. You cannot post the grades until you have every single assignment ready. If you post the grades as you go by, you will get bombarded with emails. Oh, my friend got the, the grade, and I didn't got, but I, I sent it. I can't swear to God that I sent it. So, so we mute everything, and then I get an email from the TAs. I'm done, I'm done. When I get the five, I'm done for that assignment, then I release it. And then they get an email from Canvas saying it has been released. So, so they all get it at the same time. Those are small things, but if you are not careful, that can fill out your inbox. So another thing that I do is, unless the question is of personal nature, like I'm sick, I'm a McBurney student, something like that, you cannot write to me. I, I, I teach uh, in my instructor, Mike Bowers class, yeah. yeah, you absolutely have to do that, otherwise you get... No so I have an Ask the Instructor forum where they have to post the question there. And I encourage the students, if they know the answer, to reply themselves. And if they do, that's part of their course engagement, right? Some of them, some of the people ask the question, and other students reply the answer the question. If not, I go in and answer the question. But if they write to me with a question that has already been questioned and answered in there, I don't reply. And another thing I learn uh, as I go by is you have an Ask the Structure forum. I mean, you got to start getting questions and answers, and that's like a never-ending scrolling thing because it gets this kind of like long thing. So for every module, for every week, I have a, an Ask the Instructor forum. The good thing in Canvas, you set up everything at the beginning of the semester, and every week one opens, and at the end of the week it closes, and another one opens. Can so, you yeah. So you go here to the, uh, the Ask the Instructor Forum. So you see we are in week three, model three. This is the one that is active right now. But I have already created one for every single week. These are, these are closed for comments, but they're still available. The students can see if they have to look for something. But for week three, there's now this current one <coughs> at the top here. So this is the one. And you see, for example, Week four is this one here, not available until February 4th, because that's when this module starts. So on, on February 3rd at midnight, that week three closes, becomes available for them, but they cannot add things there. And then this new one opens. So, so that way you don't have a, like an ever ending, you have to be scrolling for questions. So every week we open a new one. You see for the, the first module, the first week, I have 40 entries. Second week, 36. So that becomes a very long thing. Can so you click on, I'd like to see what that looks like. Yeah. I've never seen it. So I put an explanation. So for example, this lady. So this is, James is here. So he's helping me with this. We are testing a study pattern, which is a learning analytics tool. So we are using this. This is the sec first semester we are using this. For example, this is a student who say, oh, when I log in into study pattern, I don't see. So this is her question. This is my reply. And maybe in some, in some, let's go down a bit more. You see also, there is someone who replied into that question, someone else who replied into that question. I went back again, went back again, I went back again. Then, then this is, you see, this is something new. So you see, how do I access camera recording application? So now what I've done, the first week they have to answer, they have to do the syllabus quiz and they have to do an assignment which is not graded, which is recording themselves. They have to be able to record themselves and play them back. I say, if you play back and you don't hear it, I cannot hear that either. So they have to do a test of recording. So, I re so they, it's not surprise the first assignment I have to record and I don't know how it works. You have to do an assignment that is not graded that requires you to, you to learn how to use the tool. You can record in Canvas itself or you can record somewhere else and upload it through the Canvas tool. And when you do that, 
Canvas takes away all the formats and it puts everything in one single format. So you don't have to worry about different players, anything like that. So this is how it looks. You can do searches. The good thing of this, you can reply to this. I have subscribed to this. So if a student posts something, I get an email. So if I reply to that email, it goes here straight. Or I can come here and reply in here. You, can re you don't necessarily need to come to Canvas every time. I get an email. If I reply to that email, it, it put it in there. <coughs> What was your answer to that last question? Which one? Yeah, only one. Yeah, because there's another class called General Business 310, which is Fundamentals of Finance and Accounting, that Mark Laplan teaches that. And he we are friends, but we have very different styles. So he has every, every lecture he has, he has every week like two or three hours of video. I'm not kidding. Very good videos, but I use some of them. But he only does exams, like multiple choice exams. And I do, I do a couple of exams, very low stakes, 10% of the grade. The rest is the assignments, the weekly assignments. So I say it's no. It's not only how much you know, but if you are constant. I don't care. This is not a class where you work two days before the exam and then you pass. You have to engage, be engaged uh, as we move along. So this is, this is how it looks. You see, there's, a, there's all kinds of questions here. Usually, I. You see, for example, this person was saying, oh, how can I see the videos? And then someone down here replied, it's just podcast, there is no video. <laughs> because when you, people are not familiar, but when you go to the start <coughs> of the model here, you go to a model, they see this, and they think that this must be video. But it's just audio. And the reason why we decided to do that is this is an online course. There's people who are overseas. There are people who are deployed. There are students who are in the army right now. So they, so there was some, but also there are people here who move around. They are all over the campus. So this you can play, you can listen in the bus, you can go running and listen to it. It's not something you have to be watching. And I did some tests about it. There are other people who have recorded videos. And unless the video has a lot of like graphics or things like that, I mean, you can listen to the video without watching it, and you don't miss anything. I noticed that you did these podcasts all in Kaltura. So you're all of in these, Kaltura, but you're having your students yeah, respond. All of this is, the, when you play here, it, it goes to Kaltura. It's linked to Kaltura. The student, but the good thing of Canvas is the students log in here with their net ID. So they don't have to log in again. The, the credentials are passed through. So everything is on Kaltura, the, the podcast. And for example, we even do this, rate this podcast, that goes back to the, to the Cultura rating system. So I get that for everyone. And they get the transcript, but because the transcript, you have to put it by law. The have you had to, um, or have you chosen to, based on, have you had any like really low ratings that you're like, oh, I should go back and fix that, and you re record it based on that? No, we're, we haven't done that, that yet. We are, I mean, we did a bunch of recordings, and now we are doing new ones, and we may eliminate some of these. I mean, the, the podcast, you see, they're not very long, 11 minutes, 9 minutes, 9 minutes. And in this session, there are three, but sometimes there's only two. It's not more than that. That's, that's so like the long. And again, it's not a lecture. I don't go and lecture. It's more, I tell a story, I do examples, I interview people, or... And then they have to ask, do link that with all the readings and the content. Again, the idea is not, this is not a class where you just sit and listen very passively. They have to be engaged. Then we provide, another thing that I do is I don't use a textbook. I, this is everything in here is open source. For the textbooks, I use open source resources from the University of Minnesota. The textbooks that are there, they are great. Students can 
I link to the chapter that they can download the PDF, they can download the mobile file for their Kindles, they can download the EPUB file for their iPads. So everything, they students in this class don't have to spend any money for anything. And either there are things that <coughs> I provide, articles that I provide, or I link to the library, or there are open textbooks from the University of Minnesota. So they don't have to buy anything. Oh, I use, for example, in this case, a this is a video that I use from, from TED. The good thing of this is you link to the right place, you can get the, instead of getting those from YouTube, I link to the TED server, which has the real transcript. You can put a video, a required video that doesn't have a transcript. I mean, you can, but technically someone could complain. So that's something you have to be very careful. And I think when I use some resources that are not totally free, I have worked with the library, and they have managed to get authorization from the user, from the copyright holder to use it, either under the fair, fair usage policy, or we requested permission and they gave it to us. Usually they do. If it is not, because this class is not open, open. This is, you have to be enrolling. So you have to go through the net ID. And so some, some I use, for example, this Origin of Wealth, chapter one. This is from a real book, from a Harvard guy. I talked to him. He said, yeah, sure, you can use it. So he gave me the PDF from that chapter, and I put it in there. And what I do is instead of putting things, the things that are files, they are not really in Canvas. I put it in Box. And then I link to Box. That, the, the good thing of that is if you need to make a change in the file, you make the change in Box, but you don't have to touch anything here. You don't have to touch links, update anything. You just update your Box, and everything here remains the same. So that saves some time. Is this, so this is all one page? This is all one page. And so they just open up to the day or the course mm -hmm. period, and they can see all of these things. Can you show us what this looks like? Did you have to? Mark's magic to mess with the HTML to make this. I, I, I mess out a bit with the HTML because, mm -hmm. because I like it. <laughs> to make it look pretty, it's like, for example, my syllabus is pretty long. So I didn't want like, to make a super long file, so I created these tabs so they can go to sections. So they're going to want to see the course schedule. So you get right away here the course schedule. Is it one single long page? But I use tabs in HTML, so you say grading information, you click there and it takes you to that portion of the page. But you don't have to go up and down with the scrolling. So it's just sort of a table of contents? Yeah, but it's, it's, it's all one page. Okay. This is, in, this is in the same page as sure. this. It's yeah. one single HTML page. And I'm happy to share the code with anyone. It's very easy. In fact, when you edit here, it's just a long page. It's like a single long page. You can, you can go here and make a correction. Fix it and save again and that's it. So we just throw some HTML code in, inside so we can have these tabs, which makes a big issue. So everything, but everything is in one single page and the same for the models. This, all of this is one single page. And you can edit here and make changes right away. But this is just one single page with the readings, the videos, and assignments. Everything is one single page. Another thing that I, in terms of like managing the large groups, is, for example, I have the same way that some students drop within the first few days, you have students that come in like once the class has already started, one week after, two weeks after. So it's how, how you manage these people. Because I mean, by the time they enroll, the week one and week two may have already happened, and those assignments were already due. So I gave them an extension. And the last thing you want is manage one by one. So I create sections within Canvas. I, I have one section called late enrollment. So for, a, for the first few weeks assignments, people who are in that section, they get an extension in Canvas. So when a student comes late, I just add that student to the section. I don't have to change that particular person parameters for every single one that comes late. 
you, you have one section that is late enrollment, and that section gets granted an extension. So when a student comes in, I just drag it in there. It's a bit faster to, to do it. So another thing that we do here, I mean, we do a couple of quizzes, multiple choice. They can do it from anywhere. I don't ask them to come to any place. They, they can do it anytime, anywhere. Uh, and I usually give two or three days in terrible, they can take it in these 48 hours. So you can take it in that 48 hours whenever you want. So that way I don't have to say, oh, I have another exam or I have a conflict, I don't care. You have 48 or 72 hours to take that exam. So you can take it whenever you want. I don't have to look for an alternate or I have to get, to get a flight, I don't care. You have 72 hours, you should take it in that time. Whenever you want from wherever you are, as long as you are aware that deadlines are in US central time. Then I have that people, oh, I was in New York, I didn't realize, I don't care. We are in a global world. You need to know where you are and what time is it. Where you are and in Madison. <coughs> so, I, I mean, I, I can go more into details. I don't know, yeah, John. That's, that's up. So one of the things I, I think I mentioned already that the activity sheet is kind of sparse because we're talking about speed grade, and we're talking about discussions, we're talking about audio files, so it would be hard to like get us going in all of those. But one of the things that I asked is, what are your concerns? What are your thoughts on, or where do you, what are your uh, fears about using Canvas in a large course? And I'd be interested in hearing yours as well. Like, what, what are the frustrations that you have found that you haven't found an answer for yet? I mean, the only thing I did the first semester I did in Moodle, and then when they, they offered me the opportunity to jump to Canvas, I said, I'd rather jump soon than late. Mm -hmm. So I went ahead and jumped into Canvas. And there are some things that I miss from Moodle that maybe eventually one day will come back to, to Canvas. One thing that I used to do in Moodle that really great work, amazing, is the peer review. A lot of people even told me, you cannot do peer review in, Cam in Moodle. That's not true. In fact, peer review in Moodle works beautiful. It's amazing. You can do all kinds of uh, stuff. The peer review in Canvas is limited. <coughs> in fact, you cannot do pretty much anything. And you can do three peer reviews, but you don't get anything with the grades. You have to do calculations manually. It's a, it's a, I don't recommend it at this point. And another thing that I miss from Moodle in Canvas is the grade book calculations. Moodle has a lot of features that you can do with grades in terms of calculating things. And in that regard, Canvas is a bit still catching up. But I, I'm the one who is sending a lot of requests of things that I think that they should be there. And hopefully one day they will come. Other than that, what I like about Canvas is, I mean, the look and feel is a bit better. I really use the, the iPhone app. I, I can do pretty much everything from my phone. And the students lo love that too, because they can do everything. You can reply to the students, you can do all kinds. And the nice thing is not a web-based app. It's not like this, made, they made it look this way. It's a native app for iOS. And if you use an iPad, you can even do the speed grading from the iPad. That, that's really a nice feature. Other than that, I mean, it works really pretty much the same. I mean, the grading, the grade book is a, is a big thing. That you have to do, I have to do some calculations outside of Canvas and then bring it into Canvas. But other than that. Any I thoughts that people have, questions that you have about this, or fears that you might have that, that maybe he has already jumped into? How many of you have already jumped into Canvas and are using Canvas a little bit? Are familiar with it? Um, has anybody taken a class in it? Has anybody tried peer grading in it? Yeah, that's what one of my teaching things is on. I, I was not familiar with Moodle, so I thought the peer grading in Canvas is good because ignorance is bliss, right? I didn't know. Uh, but it's better um, than D12's well peer grading, right? Yeah. yeah. No, no, to give you an example, in, in, in Canvas, I use it last semester, and this semester I have removed it. Last semester I did it, and then you get a student submit a paper or a writing. And then I decided three students get that assignment. They remove the names and they grade. And then you get three grades. And that's it. 
And now you have to get those three grades somehow and calculate all of this. Probably with 10 students, that's easy. But you have 400, yeah. forget it. In Moodle, you can say three assignments, this assignment, three reviewers. I want the grade to be, I decided I was using 80% of the grade is the average of the three peers review, and 20% is how good as you as reviewer. And, come, and Moodle will go and say, OK, I get three papers, so I review this paper, and two other people review this paper. I get another paper, and two other people review this paper. And I get another paper that two other people review. Moodle will go and see, how far are you from the other's grades, from the other people? So if this, everybody says this paper is great, uh -huh. and you say it's really bad, it penalizes you. Yeah, I had to do that manually. But it does, Moodle does all of this automatically. The problem in Moodle is it's not called peer review. So people think that this doesn't exist in Moodle. It's called workshop. So you go to Moodle and you see this thing called workshop. It does everything for you. And it's also automatic. You can set the dates when things get assigned, the dates when the grades have to be in. It does all the calculations. You get everything. In Canvas, you only get assignment, and you get three grades separately. And now you have to do all the calculations. Moodle will do everything for you plus this how good as you as a reviewer. And you can decide what percentage of the grade and all of that, how, how much is your tolerance to, fi to be close or far. You can, yeah, it, everything it, is param it, param it, parameters. My students really liked it. One of the things, one of my goals was we were trying to teach them how to write scientifically, which has always been something that microbiology students and all science students, they struggle with that. It's hard. And one of the ways you do that is you read other, other people's work and you critique it. And the tools within Canvas for you know, working with someone else's stuff and then critiquing and adding feedback are, are pretty good. I like that. And I think that helps a lot. But you're right. I had to do all the grading manually. But I only had 100 students. I didn't have 400. So it wasn't too bad. No, and also I, I like because the peer review, because I, when I have students from all different disciplines, it's very interesting for them, because I also teach at the business school, and all the students at the business school are kind of like cookie cutter. They, are, they all have 3.8 GPA, they did great at business, uh, high school. They all have this sort of like, they have had the same background, they're all the same. And when you have a student who are fashion designers and nuclear engineers, and you put a problem, they realize that not everybody thinks like them. <laughs> and then they start seeing other points of view that they never thought. And that's really great, and uh, people really like that. But I have to wait to see if they improve it a bit in, in Canvas. Is Canvas open source, or is that no. like a company? It's a, it's a private company. It, 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 there's some sort of open something with it. <laughs> Somebody talked to me about what that is. I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, <laughs> it's a company called Instructure. I mean, originally I think it started with open source, but now you have to go back to this company for, I mean, right now, it's, I mean, it's a bit more complicated with the Unisim consortium and all of that, but. It says that it is released under the AGPL V3 license, whatever that means. But there's a GitHub link to it, so boom. So for example, to give you an idea, for this week where these audio recordings and this is how it looks. Let's see if I can get here. I think some, well, some of my TAs have already started working on this. So this is kind of nice how you can see the stuff. So this is the recording. This is how it looks here. 
and you can then, I mean, I guess you guys are familiar with the, with the grading through the rubric here, and you just keep playing. So you, you are listening and then you are clicking on the rubric. Mostly due to the high cost of producing and then you can speed that up as well. So oh yeah, you can do, you can uh, speed up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, if you, depending how they speak to, to 150, to 1.5, you can more or less understand. <laughs> if you go double the speed, it kind of get kind of harder. So then as they mentioned, like the three distinct pros are very well articulated for making an internet ring, but you just click on that. Yeah, you click on here. And you can click on like, you hear the first one, you click on one, yeah, the, yeah. then you hear the next one, you move it over a little bit. And then bit. the gray is automatically calculated. You don't have to do anything. And then you can write something here if you want, in terms of that, for that particular criteria, you want, you want to write some specific feedback, or you can write some generic feedback down here at the bottom. And you can record it also. Do you like ever do that? Give audio recording yeah. back to them? Yeah. Okay. Some TAs are more like to write. Okay. Some of them record. I mean, they have their own strategies because they have to grade about 60 assignments per week times three. So they have to grade about 180 things every week. So some of them have some genetic feedback that they have created. They copy and paste some general text and then they may edit it. I mean, which makes sense. I mean, you cannot write two paragraph, individual paragraph for each one. You, what, what tends to happen is you really focus on feedback on the people who don't do very well. Most of the time. Because they're all the ones that are struggling. But for the most part, it's amazing how they improve over time. Once they get the, the kind of like the patterns and then I throw like curve balls, like changing due dates and things like that. Or getting out, usually the assignments are due on Friday. That's another thing I learned. Never put a due assignment over the weekend. That uh, it took me, like the first semester I made that mistake. So assignments are due on Friday. If you put assignments on Sunday, then you get bombarded on over the weekend with questions. So assignments are due on Friday night. So questions come before that. So, I mean, when you have this number of students, you have to start kind of coming, sort of like giving marching orders. Otherwise, it's very hard to manage. Even though I, I pride myself on being very responsive, sometimes the students are amazed that they ask a question, and that's the good thing, like you have the iPhone. You get a question and I reply right there. Some people say, oh, you reply me in, in one minute. I say, yeah, but I was in the bus and I have my phone with me. And then they go too much info. <laughs> no, but some people, it's amazing that they, they ask a question thinking it might take two or three days to get a reply, and they get a reply right away. And that's another thing I use. I, my, in my syllabus, I say, if you, you, you write to me with an email address that is not a wish edu email address, I will not reply. That goes away. I don't read Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail accounts. In fact, you should, you should do the same because of legal reasons you could get in really big trouble if a student write to you in an email address and you reply back to that. But that's another story. <laughs> so they have to use their WISC EDU email address no matter what. So I don't, for all purposes, they have to use that. Okay. And you that have, when you communicate to the entire class, do you use the faculty center's WISC list or do you do I only group? use Canvas. In fact, let me explain this. That's also something I learned on the way. I only use the class list for the first email in the semester. After that, I only use Canvas. And in my first email to the semester, which is a welcome letter, which is also posted here in my announcements, the first thing I tell them to do, and that's something that I hope they will fix. This is a thing that Moodle did that Canvas doesn't do. So the first thing I tell them is, you go to Canvas, you go to your profile, and you have to say how you want to get notified. In Moodle, if you put an announcement, automatically everybody gets that by email. 
and they cannot unsubscribe from that. In Moodle, every time you put an announcement, a student gets an email. And they cannot say, I don't want to get those emails. For the regular discussion forums in Moodle, they can subscribe or unsubscribe. In Canvas, unless they go and say, I want to be notified, by default, they are not subscribed to anything. So my first email to them is said, the, I'm using the class list for the first and last time. From now on, the first thing you have to do is go to Canvas and in your profile, say how you want to get notified, by email, by push to your iOS, by SMS, whatever way you want. But I will not write individual emails. I put emails on announcements, and if you don't learn about this and something changes, it's your problem. Everything goes to announcements. So I put that down. Now here, when you go to your profile, I don't know how many of you, so you, no, notifications, sorry. Here, notifications in your profile. <coughs> and I put this request to the Canvas team. I don't know if they have done it, which is they should get the announcements to their email address by default. Because this is a setup from the university system. I cannot change it for this class. So uh, these announcements, they can su I subscribe to my, my email, also to my push notification to my iPhone, right? But all of these, by default, they are not checked. So I put a request to Canvas team to put the announcement. It goes automatically. But I don't know if they will do it. And then they can subscribe to other things. But this way, what I do is all my communications with the students, either if they are individually or to the whole class or sections of the class, I do it through here. So you can go to inbox. The, that, that way, the way I do this is I get every single communication remains in Moodle. I don't have to keep it in my inbox. Everything stays here. Even if the students write to me, it comes here. And if I write to him, it stays here, but they get an email. So they cannot say. So here, you, when you, you go compose a new message, I select my class, uh, General Business 311, and then I can decide who this goes. It can go. To all the students, you see my TAs, my students, I have sections in the class, which section do I want this to go, or everybody. Or I can just write the email of a particular student. That, then the student gets the email, but I get a, this recorded in Canvas. It gets a timestamp and everything. And if they write back, it gets into here. And that helps you segregate the students. In this course, it was about this course, and so that gives you Plus, you don't get, you can, you can delete stuff from your, your Outlook. Yeah. You don't need to keep it in Outlook, everything. So you can have it in there. And then the good thing of this is you can, for example, you can write an email to, let's say, to, I don't know, late enrollment students, which are this, and I can write to all of them or individuals. If I write to all of them, I can even say, send an individual message to each recipient. Oh, nice. So it will get their email address. They think I'm writing directly to them. They don't see I'm writing to a group. So depending how you, you can check here, and they will think you're writing directly to them, or uncheck it, and then they see that this is going to a group of people. And you can put attachments, you can do everything, and you get it also in your, in your Outlook, but then you can delete your Outlook and everything stays here. So you have a record of everything that went, or everything that was received. And that's kind of also nice to, you see I have here, to, and I even keep the history. So for example, this student came to me, my name, I, 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 lo I enrolled in this class late, so I replied to her. I have added you to the late enrollment section, so you get extended until today at 11.55. Week three, from now on, you have the same deadlines as everybody. So this, I, I don't need to keep it in my mailbox, in my Outlook. It's here, and it's record for her email and my email. Any other thoughts or questions? We only have three minutes left here, and I feel like I've been asking all the questions. So, yeah, I'm um, curious about the amount of time it took you to put this together, and the amount of time this takes you to to run, to run the course, I'm not sure how that compares with before it was online. 
Believe it or not, I mean, it's, it's different kind of work. It, I mean, it took me over a year and a half to put this together. I mean, not doing this only, but I was also teaching my regular things. But it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh, I sit down for a few weekends and I do this. Especially because I redesigned everything. Writing the, the rubrics takes a while. Doing that recordings takes a while. Because it's not just recording. I mean, you have to, they, are, they are all the stories. So the stories have an end and a story and a close. So everything has to close. It's not just open topics. It has a, it has a story that opens and closes. So, and then it has been produced, so in part in the, I think in this building, with the music and all the sounds and everything. That's another thing, and I have five PAs. This is because, I have to say, I have a donor who pays for all these things. Otherwise, it would be hard to do this. I have philanthropy money behind this. They put a, a recording. Well, that's the key, right? Really, the whole no, no, I mean, I think more, mostly, mostly because I mean, each TA in the business school, these are MBA students. So they get free tuition, stipend, and insurance. And the tuition only is $50,000 a year for the MBA students. So if you, how do you pay five TAs in a class? I mean, m many schools don't have, they cannot do that. And they can do it because there is someone who, who writes a check and is a donor from the university. He thinks this class should be taken by everybody. So the recording studio, he paid for a recording studio in my office. So I can record in my office. I have a mobile recording studio I can carry. But it, it looks like a lot, but it, we're talking about $800. I mean, it's not like it, it's a lot. But, and then I have, for one year and a half, I have an instructional designer that works with me. That also was paid from that. I mean. One thing is you can get an instructional designer for two sessions, and another thing is getting someone who works for you half of the week for a year and a half, who helps you with the assignment, who helps you to. Mostly than anything, he was helping me, asking me hard questions. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? Like for example, things that I never saw here, I mean, it took me a while to come out. For example, if you go here, it, it might sound trivial, but those of us who have been teaching for a while now, we get into habits, right? So, for example, this, uh, this assignment, this model has four learning outcomes, right? So, let me see where I can show you an example here. Each, each model has learning outcomes, and each, learning out and each uh, model has assignments. So there is no an assignment that is not linked to a learning outcome. And there, is, there are no learning outcomes that don't have assignments. So there is no busy work here. Everything has a purpose. And it sounds trivial, but it took me a while to do that. <coughs> because people say, oh, why are you doing teaching this? You don't have anything related to this in the assignment. Yeah, but I've been teaching this for the last 10 years. This is how I. I always d done this. Yeah, but it, it's not linked to the learning outcomes. So it's very, it took me a while to decide that I didn't need that much stuff. It wasn't a matter of teaching a lot, but teaching the right things. So uh, when you have someone who keeps pushing you every week, why are you doing this? For everything I tried to do, he was asking me, why, why, why? Mm -hmm. And then uh, it forced me to rethink a lot of things. So you see, and everything has, so the students see, okay, these are the learning outcomes, these are the assignments. There is a reason for every assignment. If not, there is no assignment. 